Hello, I'm Richard with ev for You Custom Conversions, and welcome to episode five of A Beginner's Guide to EV Conversions. In this episode, we're going to focus on motors and controllers, and we're going to talk about how to select the uh, motor and controller, uh, the connections to both, installing in the vehicle, and cooling. So let's get started. Probably the most important consideration and aspect in selecting the motor and controller, and we're going to focus on the motor right now, and that is the, the motor's ability to dissipate heat. Okay, so said another way is we, we want a motor that's capable of doing the work required without overheating. So a lot of people will look at the um, peak performance and internal combustion vehicles typically are rated peak performance. They're peak torque, peak horsepower. And you know, that's really not the best way to look at something. Historically, electric motors were rated by their duty rating. And the duty rating basically is, like I said originally, the motor's ability to dissipate heat. What that motor, what level it can work at continuously. We're gonna look at the peak performance. We're gonna look at the continuous. And we're gonna look at um, the continuous, whether it's uh, fan cooled uh, whether it's not fan cooled, non fan cooled, and then liquid cooled. For example, I chose a motor that's got 88 horsepower and 108 pound-feet of torque. And that's its peak. That's the maximum it puts out. And it could be anything. You know, we could have picked one that put out 300 horsepower. The point is that the continuous, and the, these motors are rated uh, a maximum of 120 degrees C is a maximum temperature, but the continuous run temperature is a maximum of 80 C. So if we're running this motor and not exceeding 80 C, it'll put out 45 horsepower continuously, 42 pound-feet of torque, okay? That's fan cooled, by the way. That's what's gonna put out continuously. If you have that same motor that's sealed, no fan cooling, your continuous horsepower drops down to eight horsepower and 15 pound feet. So all this to get to the point that if we're using this figure right here to determine our motor for whatever vehicle, then you can get into trouble. The figure that you should be using is this. And since it takes about 20 horsepower for the, to move the average vehicle down the road, and uh, I believe the number 60%, 60% of that power is to overcome aerodynamic drag. Now, other things that you would consider in, you know, the number you need for your vehicle is, is the vehicle's gross weight. What, what is the, the gross amount of weight that you need to move and to accelerate? The other is the drag coefficient. So it's going to take more energy to go down the freeway with a heavy vehicle that is, you know, got a high drag coefficient. You know, what is that continuous load 
uh, in normal operation going to be, and do you have enough power to do it? Just because you have high peak power, it doesn't mean that uh, you're going to have enough power to do the job or that that motor won't overheat. So you need to look at, you know, is it cooled? Is it liquid cooled? Is it fan cooled? What, what you know, what's the, that motor's ability to, you know, to dissipate heat? And so, of course, fan cooled uh, motors won't be able to do as good a job of, uh, you know, cooling themselves as a liquid cooled uh, situation. And some of them are, are oil cooled and some of them are cooled using uh, normal ethyl glycol and water uh, cooling. So that's the main consideration is what's the duty rating? What's that uh, motor's ability to, to do the work at, at hand and to, to run cool? And so back in the DC days, there was a rule of thumb that we used. And you know, uh, uh, an eight inch motor uh, could handle a 2,000 pound car, a nine inch up to 3,000, 11 inch up to 4,000, a 13 inch up to 5,000. That was just the rule of thumb that it was, was, again, an easy rule of thumb. Uh, you get to the AC motors, that kind of goes away. And so, you know, the type of AC motors has a little bit of effect, um, but mostly it comes down to, you know, what's that motor's uh, capabilities. And so a lot of times the manufacturer will, will, will say, and they've all been generous. The ones I, uh, we have used, uh, a common one, they'll say it's, it's, it's good to 3,500 pounds. And one of the things that we've noticed is at 3,500 pounds, you're not going to be doing any hot rotting. You're not going to be doing any, you know, long grades. Most of them fudge, I would say, anything under 3,000 for these common motors. And I'm not going to use any names today, but um, they tend to be generous with what, <laughs> what they think the motor can do. I'm basing my opinion on actual usage experience. Now, when you're, when you're selecting the motors, like I said, pick one that has the ability to provide the, the, the power continuously to do the job for whatever your vehicle and, and uses are. Typically, the motors and controllers, you know, need to be matched. And so, uh, and when we're looking at how they connect, you'll, you'll see why. So uh, DC ones weren't so picky uh, as long as your, your, um, your voltages were compatible or the controller was programmable. You could program the output voltage to be compatible. With AC, they have to be able to communicate in that with the AC, you're going to have um, an encoder uh, that has got to communicate with the controller so that it knows where it is and that's 360 degrees of rotation and it can tell which windings to be energized when. And so, um, so there's a, a compatibility aspect you need to look at. And then, you know, this has to be compatible. Remember we talked about battery packs and, and being compatible with all the components of your vehicles. So, you know, your motor controller, your battery pack, and all your accessories are going to have to be uh, compatible in that voltage range sense. Remember we talked about minimum voltage and maximum voltage of your pack. So that comes into play there again. So we're going to move over to the workbench and we'll look at uh, the connections, typical connections to both the motor and the controller. Here's a look at uh, uh, AC controller, and we're going to look at, you know, the connections. And so there's going to be uh, more connections to your controller than to the motor. But we're going to start right here real quick. And so we have a positive and negative from our battery pack coming in to the controller. This is positive, this is negative on this particular one. The positive 
is going to come through our contactor first. So we're going to have power coming from our battery pack coming to our contactor. It's going to go through the contactor and to the positive of our controller. It's going to leave the controller and it's going to go through our shunt and then the shunt will be connected to our negative side of our battery pack. These three connections are the three phases that will be going to the motor, U, V, and W, and it's just connects to U, V, and W on the motor. And then we have our in and output control circuits, and you can see those here. There's a, a plug that connects to that, and that will go to some other circuits, which will we'll list some of the common ones on the whiteboard. But there's another one that goes to the motor, and that's the encoder. We're going to connect uh, between the motor and the controller. Uh, there's a con an encoder connection, and we'll take a look at that on a vehicle. So not a lot of connections as far as the, the, the motor is only connected to the controller through the UV and W and then through the encoder connection. That's it. Can't get too much more, you know, simplistic than that. Uh, but then there are some other, you know, connections that go to the controller. And a, a couple, while we're looking at this display right here, one would be the throttle. The throttle connects to the controller. Our main contactor connects to the controller. The controller is what controls this contactor. And so um, let's take a look at an example in a vehicle. Example of our vehicle right here. We have power coming in from our battery pack right here. Goes through our contactor to the controller out of the controller, through the shunt, back to our battery pack, negative. So power into the controller, power out going to our motor. So here's the motor with the three phases going in. And right here, this part right here, this is the encoder wiring that goes to the controller. So these two can communicate such things like as, you know, position of the armature, RPMs, motor temperature, that type of thing. So very simple. The other thing in this um, shot we want to take a look at is the cooling. This is a coolant reservoir right here. We come out of the bottom of our reservoir. It goes to a pump. From the pump, it comes and goes through our chill plate, which is on the back side of this controller. That's wicking away the heat from the controller. And then it um, goes through a radiator and exchanges that heat with the uh, ambient air and then returns back to our reservoir. So one of the, you know, there's a couple key things in a cooling system for, for you know, any system, for whether it be the motor, uh, if you have battery cooling, controller cooling, and that is that you have to have uh, a system that is the proper volumetric size. You have enough coolant in the system to proper, properly wick away any heat, and then you have to have an, a large enough radiator system in order to, you know, uh, get rid of that heat, exchange it with the outside air. So you have to have proper volume in the system and then you want to have proper flow in the system. So you want to have a pump that is providing the proper rate of flow through this properly sized system in order to get you know, uh, efficient, sufficient coolant. So another quick look at a cooling system uh, using our demonstration board here, we have a coolant reservoir. The flow is from the bottom of the reservoir 
down to our pump, through the pump, through our chill plate. This is the controller chill plate. Goes through our radiator and back up to the reservoir. That would be your, your, your flow, direction of flow through your cooling system. So continuing with our controller connections, we have inputs like uh, KSI, your, your, your key switch input, uh, throttle, driving modes, and forward reverse. Uh, very common inputs that can be selected. And then outputs, we have your main contactor, brake lights, instrumentation, those type of things are common outputs. So we've talked about how to select, we've talked about connections, we've talked about cooling. We haven't talked about the installation in the video, in the vehicle. So there's different ways, depending if you're doing a direct drive system or what you're doing, but, but most uh, uh, of the more common and simpler uh, conversions will use an adapter and a coupler. The adapter is the piece that's going to make the motor to your transmission bell housing. So here's an example of, a, of an adapter. This is the, the side that would mate to the bell housing. This is the side that the motor would mount to. And so uh, we have lots of videos on adapters and couplers and the proper you know, dimensions and specifications uh, for that. An example of a coupler. So this fits on the motor shaft. It's what's connecting the motor output shaft to your drive shaft or your flywheel or whatever the case would be. And this case is designed to, you know, have a flywheel uh, made into it. So this is going to replicate the end of the crankshaft in the internal combustion engine. So your flywheel is going to mate to this and the clutch to the flywheel. And all of this would then be designed so that when you mount the motor and the adapter to the transmission bell housing, that the clutch and flywheel and all of that is in the same position it was when the internal combustion motor was mounted to it. So you can see it's got a, a keyway cut in there, so there would be a key that goes in there. And uh, most of the ones that we use are what's called an interference fit, which means we have to heat this up, slide it on the motor shaft, and then once it's slid on the motor shaft and it cools down, it's there to stay. So that's uh, the installation. The only other uh, aspect would be your motor mounts. And so when you're installing the motor in the vehicle, it has to be done in such a way that you're supporting the weight of the motor, you know, due to the forces of gravity, but you also have to support it uh, for the forces of torque. Because when that motor goes to turn and wants to spin the wheels, there's going to be an equal and opposite action the opposite direction, okay? A force in the opposite direction. So it's going to want to spin that motor. So that motor has to be held in place for position, up, down, back and forth, rotational. It has to be supported, you know, uh, weight-wise in there, but also has to be supported torque-wise. And uh, we have lots of uh, YouTube videos on all of that. Um, but of course, for the deepest dive in all this, of course, would be our EV workshops uh, at evworkshops.com. And of course, it goes into an in-depth of all of this. <laughs> this is just a surface beginner's view uh, to, the, to the big picture. So anyway, that's it for this episode. WWW evworkshops.com for more information. Thanks for watching. Um, 
Hope you enjoyed it. Like it. Subscribe. Hope to see you next time.